You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education, where we focus on natural resource investing. I'm your host, Bill Powers. And recently I read two books by my guest today, who is Peter Sainsbury. The first book is this one right here, Commodities, 50 Things You Really Need to Know. And the second one was written by Peter also, and it's Crude Forecast, Predictions, Pundits, and Profits in the Commodity Casino. He is an economist, and he is ranked in the top 100 economists in the world by Richtopedia. His website is materials-risk.com, and I'm going to put a link to Peter's Twitter in the description in the show notes below, so click on that to find more about Peter and his day-to-day posts. Peter, thank you for coming on Mining Stock Education to share your insights. You're an author in the commodity sector, obviously, as I've mentioned. How about you give us a little background on how you came to focus on commodity investing, please? Yeah, great. Uh, Thanks, thanks, Bill. Thanks for the um, invite onto the the podcast. Um, Yeah, my my background in commodities um, was all the way back in 2005 uh, when I was working for uh, an oil market consultancy. and what really fascinated me at the time was the, you know, the sheer number of factors that came together to, to influence the market. You know, everything from geopolitics to financial markets, um, uh, you know, the weather, all, all sorts of factors. Um, and the build-up really from sort of 2005 to 2011 was a you know, really sort of fascinating time uh, to learn about the markets. Um, and during that time, I kind of used my insights and expertise to you know, to invest primarily in, in oil uh, and to a lesser extent in, in gold and other, and other precious metals. Um, but then from about 2011, I kind of sensed that things were going to be different, that it wasn't just a case of you know, buying and holding and you know, prices were always going to go, go up. Um, so I started Materials Risk uh, and then followed up a few years later with a, you know, the, the books that you mentioned to really kind of outline um, my thought process, the things I was seeing in, in different markets, you know, how it could really help uh, individual investors you know, perform better. Do you think it's possible for the average retail investor in natural resources to be successful consistently? And if so, how? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's very difficult. It's, but for any investor in any market, you know, so many commodities as well. Yeah, you know, they need to. People need to be aware of what, um, you know, who they're up against on the other side of the trade. Um, and in the case of commodity markets as well as other financial markets, you know, a lot of that is driven by you know, algorithmic uh, trading. You know, certainly over the over the short term. Um, and other investors that have a, access to a lot more, uh, you know, up to date real time data that they can they can trade on. Um, but on, on the flip side, you know, simply you know, buying and holding commodities forever is also not necessarily a successful strategy. Um, you know, when you're buying commodities, you're you know, to some extent you're selling you know, human ingenuity. So I think that I think the sweet spot is really you know, somewhere in between those two extremes. You know, um, identifying markets that um, are in a position, position where sentiment, you know, positioning, you know, fundamentals that are just extremely negative. Um, but are showing signs of bottoming out. So then, you know, investing and riding that wave until it gets to the other, other extreme where people can only believe that it can go, only, only can go up um, and then selling out before, you know, before the tide turns. So I think, um, you know, anyone coming to commodities needs to be aware of that, you know, prices can grind lower for, for years and years. And so even if they're, overall thesis of you know, why prices should be higher eventually you know, turn out to be correct. Um, you know, investors need to be aware that um, you know, they might need to hold that investment for some time um, and then it can become quite you know, psychologically difficult to, you know, to hold something over time that's you know, gradually diminishing in value. So it's um, yeah, holding it for the long term. Many investors in the mining sector, which we primarily focus on, start with uh, researching and finding a commodity that they believe has strong fundamentals for a rising price. What do you think for the average retail investor, their ability to forecast 
where the direction of a given commodity is going. Is that possible, especially with how the price can be manipulated in the futures market? Yeah, I think um, I think that on the one hand, um, you know, forecasts are you know, provided by you know, investment banks and others um, to give a sense of, of where you know, where prices are in the future. And the the research research I did was that you know, people that you'd think would should know how to do this um, you know, do not. Um, are not very good at necessarily forecasting even you know, six months out. Um, you know, in, the, in the period between 2007 and 2016, uh, the average crude market forecast was about out to about sort of 27%. You know, that's, that's quite extreme over just, just such a short time period. Um, so what tends to happen is you know, forecasts are heavily, heavily influenced by a recency bias. So you know, what, what's happened just in the, in the past um, in the past couple of months, you know, dictates what people's perceptions are of the future. Um, and then, um, you know, I mean, there, there are different ways you can look to see where the prices are going to be likely to be in the future. You know, everything from you know, futures prices to the fundamentals. You know, what's happening to the cost of cost of production, and you know, the exchange rate of different uh, commodity currencies. Um, and, e- and even just looking where you know, t- what today's price is. Um, so I, th- I think what um, people perhaps ne- need to get away from is not necessarily forecasting where the future is or, or relying on other people's forecasts. It's looking at positions where there's a kind of an asymmetric trade on, on, the, on the table where there's you know, potentially low downside, but there's potential for the prices to be much, much higher than where they are currently. If we look at the macro situation in commodities on that note, would you say that the macro situation is in the favor of somebody who's beginning to invest in commodities right now? And put that in historical perspective for us, please. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the thing to note is that, you know, commodities tend to move in in long, very long cycles, which tend to last around, say, 20, 25 years. Um, and that can involve, you know, 10 to 15 years of rising prices, followed by, you know, a slow unwind over, over a similar time scale. Um, you know, prices in the most recent cycle peaked you know, anywhere between 2007 and 2011. Uh, and then we've had this sort of slow unwind since then for, for most commodities, you know, uh, gold and other precious metals being, um, you know, a recent exception to that. Um, so there are some signs that prices are really starting to bottom out. Um, and if you look historically, you know, where we are at the moment, you, know, you could identify it with uh, the early 1990s, uh, late 1960s, and then you know, even further back to the sort of late 1920s, where we're in a similar situation where commodity prices were so low, there were you know, producers of commodities were, um, were valued at such a small portion of the overall uh, equity market. Um, and while I don't necessarily think we're going to be seeing return to, you know, the, the kind of inflation we saw in the 1970s, um, you know, even a, a return to, say, 4 or 5% CPI would be a massive change versus what um, investors are used to. Um, you know, we've got the sort of deflationary impact, uh, forces of, you know, demographics, debt and you know, technology, um, but commodities will all, always be in demand, um, and you know, over the next five, ten years, there will be there will be end market applications which we, you know, we haven't actually, um, you know, envisaged or you know, in place at the moment. And so that that it's all kind of setting the stage for um, you know a rebound in prices over the next you know five to ten years. What I like about resource investing is that you're not just, you have so many different options. You can research, you can find a metal, a mineral, a soft commodity to uh, find that sector to potentially profit at any given time. So if investors are have that perspective and they're looking across the broad opportunities and commodities, talk to us about the difference in soft commodities versus mined commodities, which we typically focus on. Yeah, your listeners will be familiar with you know, the kind of long, very long cycle, you know, capital cycle that's involved with mined commodities. You know, that's can be anywhere from, you know, 
several years to you know, more than a decade to bring on a new mine. Um, so there's a very long time lag between uh, developments in the price and then how that supply is actually brought back up, back into the market to take advantage of that, that higher price. Um, when it comes to soft commodities, you know, that cycle can be a lot, lot quicker. Um, so it can vary from as little as a year for things like corn and wheat and other, other grains like that to you know, maybe three or four years for cocoa. Um, but then yeah, for other commodities like, um, like, uh, like timber, you know, forests, you know, the cycle can be you know, several years or even a decade or more. Um, so I think it's, it's being aware of those you know, long cycles. Um, so while an investor in, in metals, you know, mined commodities can take advantage of that long capital cycle, you know, it can take a long time for that, that, that extra supply to come onto the market. If you are looking at um, soft commodities, you need to be much more adaptable and, and looking forward to you know, where that supply is going to come on in the next six months or, or 12 months. What about currencies? When you're looking at a commodity, you've, you're researching it. Talk to us about the role in, in the due diligence process of researching the currencies that are, are affecting that commodity. Yeah, so um, the, the currency, um, you know, commodities tend to be virtually all priced in, in, in dollars. Um, but the role of the, uh, you know, the currency that that, you know, of a major producer has a big, has a big impact. Uh, so one example might be uh, the Brazilian real. And um, so Brazil is a major producer of you know, sugar, coffee, uh, soybeans, uh, iron, ore, iron ore as well. Um, but, you know, the Brazilian economy has suffered you know, numerous kind of economic and you know, political misfortunes over the, you know, over several years or, or more. Um, and that's, has led to a drop in the real against the dollar. Um, you know, that gives a boost to Brazilian exporters who you know, can sell denom dollar denominated commodities, um, but then which then rise in terms of, of real. Um, so you need to be kind of conscious of those kind of broader um, political and economic factors that could affect the currency of a, of a major exporter. Um, but there's also, you have to watch out for those examples where that doesn't always happen. Um, so a good example is the, you know, the Aussie dollar versus the, the US dollar. Um, and in the past, that's typically been correlated with you know, iron ore prices since um, you know, iron ore is, um, you know, Australia is one of the main suppliers of iron ore to China. So the exchange rate um, often offers a, a kind of leading indicator of where uh, iron ore prices are gonna go in the future. But what we saw from, from 2018 was that relationship broke down and uh, the, the dollar fell while iron ore prices rebounded. And so on, on the face of it, that suggested that you know, perhaps iron ore prices weren't sustainable, but it was probably a better reflection of the, you know, the breakdown in the trading relationships between Australia and China. Okay. Assuming Joe Biden wins, uh, you know, it's not yet to be certified here in the United States, as you know, it's still being contested. But if there is a Biden presidency uh, with an international perspective that you bring, how do you see that affecting U.S.-China relations? And consequently, for us resource investors, what investment opportunities might arise out of it? Yeah, so from, from, from where I say, I, I don't necessarily see that relationship changing too much. Um, the... Um, you know what you, see, what you see and hear in the press might soften, you know, in terms of the communication between the two countries. But I think, from what I understand, the the concerns that you know, Trump has with China is, uh, is very similar to uh, the concerns that Biden and his team share with, with China. So I don't necessarily see that, um, uh, you know, that tension you know, dissipating. Um, so if I think in in terms of how that could evolve, you know, some of the best opportunities could be in those commodities that are, that are valuable from a, you know, security of supply perspective. Um, while also sort of coupled with the materials needed for, you know, the, the energy transition, the climate transition that, um, you know, Biden is, you know, um, you know uh, 
his, his campaign has, has stood on. Um, so when you think about that, that's things like rare earth metals um, and other commodities that you know, China really still holds most of the cards when it comes to that, you know, that part of the periodic table. Um, you know, even I think it's back in two thousand, you know, back in last year, um, you know, China issued a, a notice saying that you know it wouldn't rule out using rare earth exports as a you know as a leverage to deal with um, the tension between them and uh, the US. And I understand that that new law comes into effect um, you know, early next month, I believe. Um, so which could, which could mean you know, potentially they might restrict rare earth exports. Um, you know, we saw back in 2011, I think it was, was the last time there was a, you know, those prices went, you know, stratospheric. Um, and there was, a, you know, one or two producers outside of, outside of China that, um, you know, stood to benefit from that. Where do you see good investment opportunities in the resource sector, regardless of U.S.-China relations? Where would you identify the best opportunities? Yeah, I think um, I'd look at yeah, the, the certainly precious metals in particular have had a good run this year, um, but they remain you know, underowned by investors you know, and undervalued, I think, relative to the actual price of um, the underlying metal. Um, you know, precious metals, they sold off yesterday on the, on the news of the vaccine. Um, but I think anyone who believes that um, you know, the case for, a, for gold, you know, for a hard store of value has gone away, I think, I think is a mistake. And so I think, um, I think precious metals, in particular gold, still have a long way to run. And I think you know, potentially now is quite a good um, entry opportunity if, if uh, commodity investors haven't um, entered that market. Um, I think a further afield, I think there's something that I'm, I'm getting involved with is the, uh, the potash market. Um, so along with uh, phosphate and, and nitrogen, you know, potash is a, a key ingredient for fertilizer. Um, but potash is also you know, highly uh, energy intensive, it's got you know, concentrated production. Um, and it's also known as you know, pink gold because um, it's a hedge against future food, food insecurity. Um, so what we've seen over the last six months uh, as part of how countries have responded to COVID is that um, you know, food insecurity has gone up, up the agenda. Uh, countries have looked to you know, restrict exports um, you know, and try and invest in ensuring that they're more um, self-sufficient domestically. Um, over the next sort of couple of decades, you know, global food supplies are going to need to rise you know, maybe by sort of seventy percent. Um, so, all of that means is there's going to be a lot more um, attention focused on potash to help, you know, help in, increase increase yields from farmland. Um, so, you know, as with other many other commodities, you've seen a, a, there's been a down cycle over the past you know, ten years. The price of potash is you know really kind of halved in value. Um, but what we're seeing at the moment is um, a number of um, you know, potential for um, uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions uh, among the space. So we've seen uh, BHP bid for the Canadian company Potash Corp, which is the, the biggest producer of potash. Um, so I think yeah, there's some interesting signs there that um, uh, you know, the market might be turning. What about oil? Before you go, uh, you wrote a book on oil. Uh, where's the opportunity here? Yeah, and I think... Um, well, it's, it's, I think many in the business would, are, um, or many in sort of, uh, financial media would argue it's almost uh, uninvestable. You know, it's a hated uh, asset. Um, you know, you, had, you only had to look at an article yesterday or the day before saying that, um, I think it's from Bloomberg saying, you know, oil prices are only going to go in, in one direction, you know, as in, you know, uh, lower. So, you know, going back to my earlier points about, you know, sentiment and you know, positioning and you know, fundamentals. Yeah, you know, the narrative around oil is so so low at the moment. Um, that's probably you know pricing in just too bad a, um, an outcome at the moment. Um, we've also so you know what that's going to 
probably evol um, evolve into is you know there's going to be a shortage of investment into into new supply over the next um, you know, five to ten years. And so when we do come out of uh, out of COVID and you know demand starts to return, people start driving in cars, flying, going on holidays. That you know there won't be the supply of oil to um, to meet that demand. Um, so we could see you know materially higher oil prices over the next um, over the next few years. And I think I think there's also an interesting angle here about um, um, you know related to sort of ESG investment as well. And so if you think of a company like uh, Exxon, you know it's, again it's a, a kind of a hated company in many respects. Um, but what that could evolve into, you know, coupled with a, a higher um, uh, a higher oil market over the next few years, is that it could be, you know, potentially you know, very high dividend yields and potential for, you know, the, the share price to, um, um, you know, to go up much much quicker than the, than the price of oil over the next over the next few years. So I think that those are the sort of key things I've, I'm really interested in when it comes to oil. Excellent. Your website again is materials-risk.com. What will investors find there? Yeah, there, there's um, there's links. There's um, lots of my articles. I tend to publish you know one, one, once or twice a week um, about some of the interesting things I'm I'm seeing in the markets and um, you know different sometimes historical perspectives on on how investors should think about certain things and what um, you know, how the future might evolve. And there's also links to you know uh, all my you know, the books and other resources, as well as um, you know some other um, sort of podcast and, and other book recommendations as well. Excellent. Well, Peter, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for talking about to us about commodity investing. Thanks, Thank you for listening to Mining Stock Education. Please subscribe and share this show with like-minded investors. Connect with us at miningstockeducation.com and sign up for our email list to stay in touch. Much success to you as you learn about, invest in, and profit from mining stocks.